the Stuarts, a bloody reign is an evocation of the extraordinary era when these four Stuart kings lived through turbulent times. Catholic versus Protestant. Parliament against King. The English Civil War. Europe torn apart by religious conflict. The plague, the Great Fire of London. And finally, a Catholic king fled his country and his throne. As we reveal their fates, we'll trace the story of another family, the Wynns who lived here at Gwydir. They were there for the great events of the era and their fortunes rose and fell with that of the Stuarts. James I inherited a throne through his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots. This would bring the two kingdoms together, but at such a bloody cost. I admire James I. I like his intellect and his inquiring mind. He was somebody who was very curious about life, a man who was trying to make sense of the world. I think it's very important with James that he felt himself committed to promoting unity of his peoples, the peoples of England, Ireland and Scotland, unity of Europe and the union of Christianity itself that might even reunite Protestants and Catholics. Charles I, the reluctant king, pushed into being the heir because his brother, the magnificently suitable Prince Henry, had died. Charles struggled to be the king that everyone longed for. Through history, we think Charles I lost his head, having lost the Civil War. But we forget the years when he was seen as the luckiest monarch in Europe. He was a highly sophisticated king. He really put British visual culture on the map, both in terms of what he commissioned in the form of Rubens and Van Dyck, but also what he collected. Charles II, the restoration would bring unity and glamour back to the country. The people were worn out by the austerity of Cromwell and the parliamentarian era and ecstatically welcomed the new king. In the reign of Charles II, you have the birth of modern times. Clever people who were literally rebuilding England. And then the fire in London, which enabled London to be rebuilt. It must have been so exciting uh, by the time you got to about 1700 to look around and find yourself in this spanking new city. James II, the Catholic king of a Protestant country, was a disaster waiting to happen. I think history is very tough on James II. He was a very brave, headstrong figure, a very good soldier, very good admiral. But unfortunately, being so pig-headedly Roman Catholic was the undoing of him. In the autumn of 1605, a letter arrived here at Gwydir Castle for the owner, Sir John Wynne. It contained an urgent message. It implored Sir John not to travel to London for the opening of Parliament that November. Wynne had been planning to do just that. King James I, all his ministers and the Lords would be attending. John Wynne didn't know it at the time, but he just received a tip-off about the most notorious attempted terror attack in British history, the Gunpowder Plot. A small group of religious fanatics wanted to blurt Parliament, kill the King, and return Protestant England to the Catholic faith. The plot failed, but to this day, the 5th of November is celebrated across the country with bonfires and fireworks. But there was far more to King James I's rule than gunpowder, treason, and plot. James was the first of a new dynasty to rule England, the Stuarts, and he came to the throne at a dangerous time. 
Britain was divided as never before between nations, between religions, between rulers and the ruled. Rebellion was in the air. Queen Elizabeth I had died on the 24th of March, 1603. She had ruled England for over 44 years, but she left no heir, so she would be the last of the Tudor monarchs. Succeeding her would be King James VI of Scotland, the son of a woman Elizabeth had put to death, Mary, Queen of Scots. However, despite this difficult family history, James I's succession to the English throne had been agreed by both parties by a secret correspondence in the years before Elizabeth's death. James had held the Scottish throne since he was just 13 months old, but now he would sit on the thrones of England and Ireland as well, in what was known as the Union of the Crowns. We are here at the Charter House in Smithfield, London. This magnificent complex began life as a home to Carthusian monks in the 14th century. But its days as a monastery were brought to a violent end during the reign of Henry VIII. It became one of the great aristocratic houses during the Tudor period. And when King James VI of Scotland, soon to be King James I of England, headed down from Edinburgh to London in 1603, he held his first ever court right here. James had been invited to do so by Thomas Howard. Howard would be rewarded with the title of Lord Chamberlain in the new King's government. Charter House is now a palace of the Howard family. Suffolk, resident there, is related to the man who had tried to depose Elizabeth in favour of James's mother, Mary, Queen of Scots. So the Howards are people he knows are loyal to him, and it seems to him that he's going to make him Lord Chamberlain, the head of his household, uh, the, the man in charge of the everyday management of the court, that he's a crucial figure and he should be given priority when it comes to uh, meetings in London and where he's seen to be. James had been greeted by huge crowds of enthusiastic supporters as he made his way down from Scotland. But things turned sour almost as soon as he reached London and held his first court here at the Charter House. The original monastery built on this site was constructed on land that had been used to bury the countless dead from the Great Plague of the 14th century. Of course, the threat of another outbreak always remained, and it just so happened that the dreaded disease returned with a vengeance almost as soon as James arrived. It hampered his plans for coronation, and for many of the citizens, it was a bad omen about his reign. Plague had been something they'd all lived with in these houses um, forever. I mean, they were well used to outbreaks of the plague, not just in London, but local outbreaks as well. Those that don't like James think it's a judgment from God. Those who do like James think it's an unfortunate recurrence of the plague. There's apprehension because he's a foreigner, because the English on the whole don't like the Scots, uh, and because they're worried about a Scottish takeover. And James um, has to balance that very carefully because if he, he doesn't want to become a purely English king, neglecting his original kingdom to the north, but neither does he want the Scots to take over. And he does initially, particularly, a very good balancing act. James knew he had to be especially careful of usurpers. His father, Lord Darnley, had been murdered and his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, had been executed. He'd faced attempts on his life while ruling in Scotland and this didn't change in England. Almost immediately, two plots were being made to remove him from power. The main plot, the by-plot. Sir Walter Raleigh, one of Queen Elizabeth's favourites, was even involved in the conspiracy but it was the gunpowder plot of 1605 that would come the closest to eliminating King James I. The winds here at Gwydir are supporters of the new King James and are advancing in courtly life. John Wynne, head of the family, is about to return to Whitehall. Attending Parliament would be injurious to my health. 
Richard, what meaning do you impute to that? Come on, boy. He is your physician. Ah. The city heirs will be fettered, of course, and all manner of thieves and cutthroats will dog my journey, with plenty more to be found in Parliament besides. But ever before was it thus, and no letter then from my dear friend the doctor. Some new peril lies behind this innovation. One that strikes a Parliament, and even the King. Aye. Should we warn His Majesty? There's always a problem with plots, as with a gunpowder plot, that in order to succeed, you have to have enough people to carry through the aftermath of the assassination of the king. But the more people you tell, the more likely it is you'll tell the wrong people and they'll leak it. Uh, and that's what seems to have happened here. It is one of the great what-if moments in history. The 13 conspirators hired a cellar directly below the chamber in which James was due to appear. Under the supervision of their munitions expert, Guy Fawkes, they filled the cellar with dozens of barrels of gunpowder, more than enough to do the job. But too many people were being warned to stay away, and this aroused suspicions. One was the Catholic priest who warned his old friend, John Wynne. Another was the writer of an anonymous letter which eventually made its way to the king and his privy council. And it will be Thomas Howard, the owner of the Charter House, and now the new Lord Chamberlain, who would head down to the cellars of Parliament in order to investigate. The entire cellars were searched, and Guy Fawkes and his bowels of gunpowder were discovered. After days of terrible torture, Fawkes confessed. The other conspirators were killed or captured. The plot had failed. The demise of the would-be terrorists triggered national rejoicing. But the plot exposed the divisions in James's new kingdom. How would he handle these challenges? And how would the Wynne family thrive in this dangerous new world? The gunpowder plot of 1605 had been foiled at the last moment. Parliament had been saved from destruction, and King James I continued to rule over Scotland, Ireland and England. But this would be a challenging reign, to say the least. James had been raised a Protestant, and a Catholic conspiracy had been made against his life. To further worsen matters, not all of his new subjects were very pleased with the idea of a Scottish king, nor were the Scots thrilled by their monarch's departure for London. James sought to maintain peace amid these divisions. He did tighten anti-Catholic measures after the gunpowder plot, but Otherwise, he broadly tolerated religious difference, provided it didn't threaten his rule. And there was another slight issue to deal with, a lack of money. A constant shortage of funds had plagued his time ruling in Edinburgh, and James hoped this new kingdom would solve all his financial woes. This wouldn't quite be the case, given how extravagant a court James liked to maintain. So new money-making ventures were needed, and this need would benefit the Wynne family of North Wales. Is this all of them? It is. I'm certain there were more. The letters patent have been issued. You do still have that list I sent you. Owen, father is made baronet. His majesty has bestowed upon us a great honor. An honor we must pay for, 300 pounds a year. For three years? Can purchase many books there exist some things more important than swelling your library, brother. I cannot conceive of them. The title will be the family's forever. It will be our dear brother John's and his sons and his sons after that. We younger brothers are better off investing in books. It is a sign of royal favor. It is a sign that the king has run out of money. Now have you that list I sent you or nay? The Winds of Goodyear are perhaps the very first to get the baronet, which is a new hereditary knighthood at the James Institutes. You see, that's a very good way both of giving people a higher honour than just being an ordinary knight, and of course it's a money raiser because you pay for the privilege of being made a baronet. Sir John Wynne was one of the first baronets, and the reason was that he was perceived to be the senior knight of Wales, really. There were two of Wales, uh, one from the south, Sir Edward Stradling, and one from the north, Sir John Wynne. And I think it was self-evident when they put the lists together that his extraordinary dominance in all public affairs in North Wales uh, meant that he was going to be on the list. 
He's very much of the period in that he's canny, acquisitive, he's very intelligent and very well educated, um, but he's carving out an empire for himself um, at a time when other people are doing similar. So there are a lot of heads being trodden on to get where he is, and that means there's a lot of jealousy, a lot of envy from his contemporaries, particularly his neighbours. This was a win-win situation for the Wins and the Stuarts. John gained greater power and status, and King James got money for the treasury by giving away titles to his most loyal subjects at an excellent price. King James needed to raise funds directly from the wealthier families in the country because he was often in conflict with Parliament, both in Scotland and England. He had been set on unifying his two nations. The kingdoms were on the same island after all, and now they had the same ruler. James believed that God had made it so for a reason. The English and Scottish parliaments were fiercely opposed to the idea of Great Britain. However, the debates, they're about prejudice. Scots feared they'd be ignored by the English, while the English feared the Scots would undercut wages and steal jobs. Mutual animosity ensured the scheme never proceeded. On the margins, there are people who really can't take James, they can't take a Scotsman, they can't take a Protestant. So there are a group of plotters who engage themselves with the idea of getting rid of him and replacing him by his cousin Arabella Stuart, who is also descended from Henry VIII's elder sister. There was also the problem of competing visions. James believed in the divine right of kings. He illustrated his views in two of his published works, The True Law of Free Monarchy and Basilican Doran, which is Greek for royal gift. James believed he was chosen by God to rule, therefore the law was an extension of his power and Parliament was subordinate. Many in Parliament viewed the relationship differently. They believed a king ruled through partnership and cooperation with lawmakers. This fundamental disagreement doomed the relationship, and for much of his reign, James attempted to rule without Parliament, hence the need for extra sources of money. I think one of the tragedies for the Stuarts, we look back on the executions, the exiles, and the general disastrous relationship with Parliament through a lot of the century or so that they were in control in this country. And one thing that is absolutely true is that they never had enough money. And uh, Parliament wasn't prepared to give enough or to tax enough in their own way. James brings in surcharges on customs, which are called impositions, which don't have parliamentary authority and therefore are controversial with some. And the result of that is that the kings can manage on their own income in peacetime. The problem is, what will they do if they get into wars? then you do need parliamentary supply. You can't possibly fund wars otherwise. And that's where the problems are going to arise. James was struck by the greatest tragedy that could befall a man who believed in the divine right of kings, the death of his firstborn son and heir. James has two children who survive infancy, a Henry, who had all the hallmarks of being a great all-rounder, great sportsman, great promoter of the arts, but also someone who is clearly quite radical in his Protestantism and is strongly supportive of the Protestant cause internationally. Henry dies in a rather unwise exercise of athleticism by swimming in the Thames and getting typhoid from the water. Whereas his younger brother, Charles, who'd had rickets as a, as a child, was bandy-legged, small, had a stutter, uh, wasn't intellectually the match of his older brother, he lives on and is to be the heir. And I always suspect that when James and perhaps Anne looked at Charles, they always looked with regret, why are you the survivor? Why has our golden boy died? The country was devastated to learn about his sudden death, and a period of mourning ensued. His younger brother, Charles, who'd adored his elder brother and tried to emulate him, would now be the successor to James. Back at Gwydir Castle, Sir John Wynne would suffer a similar 
tragic loss. Not long after the death of the heir to the throne, Prince Henry, devastating news arrives from Lucca in Italy about the passing of the Wynne's eldest son, John. Dispatched from Tuscany by his companions. They had that decency at least. Dated this 23rd of August, 1614. Bequests to the parish first, of course, as is proper. The family. To my brother Owen, 10 pounds for the purchase of books. With temperance to your usual habits, that should see you through a week, perhaps. Thank you, Father. Thank your good brother. To Richard, my velvet coat. Father, I need not. Take it. Put it on. Ah. It's interesting that, of course, James I loses his eldest son, uh, Prince Henry, um, and Sir John Wynne loses his eldest son, uh, Sir John Jr. So that they're both in the same sort of position in that sense, where uh, the second sons have to take over. So it's interesting that Sir Richard takes over that courtly role and ends up serving Charles, who is himself the number two. The Wynne family and the Stuarts grew ever closer as Richard Wynne was appointed groom of the bedchamber to Charles, the new heir to the throne, and would join him on a wild and highly secretive voyage to Spain. But for now, both families were in deep mourning. Richard, I must make ready. I am required at court. Stay a day or two, for mother's sake. I serve the young prince. I hear he is a fine marksman now. Tolerably so. And a better rider than most. He stammers yet and speaks too soft. But his efforts, I am certain, gladden his father. Stay safe in London, brother. It becomes you well. At this point, King James seemed beset on all sides and he increasingly relied only upon his closest advisers. But this also led to huge resentments over the years with the chief among them, his infamous and controversial favorites. There's long been speculation over James's sexuality because although the king was married to Anne of Denmark, he had seven children by her. He was always drawn to handsome men, often with near disastrous consequences. The favourite of his childhood years in Scotland, the Duke of Lennox, had been forced out by jealous lords. Robert Carr, another who was close to James during the early years of his reign in England, until a court scandal engulfed him, a handsome, foolish youth, ended his career. James then transferred his affections to another young courtier, a man named George Villiers. He would use the king's favour to sideline rival factions, enrich his family and become the most powerful nobleman in the country. The Wynne family weren't the only ones climbing up the social ladder during James's reign. Villiers was obviously fantastically physically attractive. This is written about by ambassadors at the time. They were absolutely struck dumb by his physical beauty. And it was something that he was very aware of. And of course, you know, James I uh, fell in love with him. He was born into a decent but not massive gentry family, and then he puts him up to every stage. Baron, Viscount, Earl, Marquis, Duke. I mean, there hasn't been a non-royal Duke for a couple of hundred years. There's always the jealousy of the overmighty courtier, but in this one man, Buckingham, his rise through the aristocracy, the way that the favour from the royal crown cascaded through his wider family, it must have been incredibly difficult for the older aristocracy to look at this man, arrive from almost nothing, and become, by some distance, the most powerful man in the kingdom. George Villiers would be raised to the title of Duke of Buckingham. He would be at the king's side for the rest of his reign, and he would play a crucial part in the events that would push England into war. We're 
here at the Queen's House in Greenwich, a magnificent building designed by the greatest architect of his era, Inigo Jones. It began construction in 1616 under the orders of King James I and was intended as a gift for his wife, Anne of Denmark, whom he'd married in 1589. But Anne would never see her finished Queen's House. She fell ill soon after construction began and died in 1619. Anne's a mysterious figure, emblematic of the challenging religious era in which she reigned. She had been raised a Lutheran in Denmark, but it's possible that she may have secretly converted to Catholicism at some point in her life. She infamously refused an Anglican communion at her coronation in England. If Anne did convert, well, even a queen had to keep it a very tightly guarded secret. The lure of the old faith seems to have been present for the Wynne family at Guido Castle as well. But being a Catholic was a very dangerous endeavor. Father. Will you not sit, Father? I am not yet so infirm, eager though you may be for your inheritance some wine. Of course. The prince still pins hope on the Spanish match. He has a portrait of the Infanta he much admires. Enough of the prince's fancy. What of the king? He too remains set. I wrote of this in my letter. You lack your brother's memorable expression. And the dowry? 600,000. Utterly dulky. The pleasing and the useful. Ah, the money spent on your schooling were not all wasted then. We know very little about their personal beliefs religiously because this is such a dangerous time. You're not going to wear that. I think it's, we have to read between the lines. I think it's pretty clear that um, his wife, Lady Sidney Wynne, um, she certainly came from an old, uh, old faith family, the Gerards of Lancashire. Uh, I think it's pretty clear, reading between the lines, that she remained Catholic, but it was a secret. She was a crypto-Catholic. She is to be allowed mass for herself and for her household, the Infanta. Should the contract be made? She will not be queen. A papist alone, England could suffer, but not a Spaniard do. Many in court favor the match. Until the tide shifts. And then marvel at how forgetful of his past a man can be. <laughs> yes, father. Do not turn papist, Richard. That was your dear late brother's mistake. You keep that faction at a clear remove. Do you understand me? I think one of the extraordinary things about the House of Stuart is that the whole tragedy of Catholic versus Protestant is contained within this royal house. It was never resolved, the question of whether England should become a Catholic or a Protestant country. You'd think, if you were a modern person, particularly if you weren't religious, but you just liked the idea of the Church of England and its inclusiveness and its beautiful music and its ceremonies, that this would have been the perfect compromise between the Protestant religion and the Catholic faith. In fact, it was even more divisive. And out of that arose the terrible, bloody English civil wars. You can become a known Catholic, you can become a recusant, and it'll kill your estate. The fines are so horrendously large that you can bleed out the estate, and that'll be the end of that. So if on principle you want to do that, fine, and a lot of people did it. But most people actually just towed the line and they, they went to church and, and they did their obeisance and um, privately they might, might have thought otherwise. I think there was a lot of what one might flippantly call sort of cafetier Catholicism going on, particularly with people like Sir John Wynne. King James I was well aware of the delicate religious situation in the country. Many of his subjects in England and Scotland would be furious at any return to the Catholic religion in the royal family. But still, despite this, James attempted a union with Catholic Spain. By 1619, the king had lost his wife and his firstborn son and heir, and he would not get any respite in foreign affairs. War had broken out on the continent. The Thirty Years' War started in 1618. What began as a quarrel among the divided states of the Holy Roman Empire drew in all the major powers of the day, 
and with eight million casualties, it became the bloodiest religious conflict in European history. It was also the greatest foreign policy failure of King James I's reign. I think for the British living across the sea from the Thirty Years' War, it must have been a very frightening spectator sport, especially with the propaganda coming back from both sides. It resonated very much over here that this sort of absolute catastrophe could happen here through religious bigotry. I think it was uh, something that the English looked at askance and thought, we just cannot have that here. James was a peacemaker. He had ended the long Anglo-Spanish war soon after inheriting the throne, and he had grand hopes of securing a lasting peace in Europe. To do this, he began negotiations to marry his heir, Charles, to the Catholic Infanta of Spain, Maria Anna. The protracted talks were unpopular with the English Protestants. James, however, was more tolerant of religious differences than many. And he persisted. He believed binding England and Catholic Spain together would help secure peace in Europe. The Thirty Years' War confounded all those hopes. It was a conflict the king could not ignore because he had a personal stake in it. His daughter, Elizabeth, she was married to the Protestant Frederick V of the Electoral Palatinate, a pivotal figure in the early years of the war. England is requiring that the Spanish drive their cousins, the Austrians, out of the lands of James's daughter and her husband in, in the Palatinate, and that you're just asking too much. Rome is asking too much in that Rome is expecting the children of the marriage to be brought up as Catholics, and James and Charles can't deliver that. So both sides were willing to make a deal, but only on their own terms, and the gap between them was simply too great. After the catastrophic defeat of Elizabeth and Frederick's forces at the Battle of White Mountain outside Prague in November 1620, James had to intervene. But war was expensive, and money had long been a problem for the English crown. James would call Parliament, but the meeting was fractious and the MPs were more interested in investigating abuses by James's government than giving him the cash he wanted. James soon dissolved the meeting, as he had done so often before. He now had no choice but to rely on his diplomatic efforts. The Spanish match for his son was the only chance he saw of diffusing the conflict and helping his daughter. Negotiation with Madrid began again, but at the same slow pace as before. Frustrated by these constant delays, James's favourite, the Duke of Buckingham, and his son, Prince Charles, made an extraordinary decision. It is my ill fortune to be one of those who is shortly to follow the Prince into Spain. Past doubt, the journey will be dangerous and expensive but as subject and servant, I must needs obey. Prince Charles and the Duke of Buckingham were heading to Spain incognito, and Sir John Wynne's son and heir, Richard, was going with them. In February 1623, this group left England in disguise for a potentially perilous journey across Europe. The goal was to break the deadlock in the marriage negotiations with Charles winning the hand of the Spanish Infanta in person. It was romantic, foolishly daring, and it was doomed. In the spring of 1623, Richard Wynne, the heir to the Wynne estate, was travelling to Spain along with Prince Charles, the heir to the throne, and the Duke of Buckingham. Richard wrote back home to Gwydir that he did not care for Spain at all. Richard's letter is full of fascinating insights, but there's one I really wanted to read to you. The group encounters a Spanish Jesuit priest who is preaching to the crowd. The priest's description of England vividly illustrates the religious challenges of the era. Henry VIII, King of England, until whose time the subjects there were obedient children to their mother church of Rome, having many famous martyrs that suffered for the cause, as Sir Thomas Becket and Sir Thomas More and diverse others. 
this king, I say, was the first who to satisfy his own lust and to bring his adulterous conception to his own heart's desire did, forgetting God and religion, alter the course of the ever-held obedience to the Church of Rome by dissolving their abbeys and putting to death I know not how many hundreds, for which act his soul lies chained in the bottomless pit of hell, in everlasting torments. This is not all their heretical opinions, but the damnablest and worst of all is, which is my last point, this is my body. They dare have the impudence to deny our Saviour's own words, saying it is but a sign and not the body and blood itself. Prince Charles wasn't likely to have much success on this Spanish sojourn. The Spanish trip was an extraordinary fiasco, really, and, and marvellously amateurish and, and silly. It was like a sort of adolescent jape in some ways. To think that this would be anything other than a diplomatic disaster, which of course it was, uh, was, was pretty naive. But off they went, um, Prince Charles and Duke of Buckingham, and, and of course, Sir Richard Wynne. Sir Richard had a, a very low opinion of Spain. He said there's no land worth speaking of, and the worst counties of North Wales are better than what he saw in Castile and Aragon. I mean, he's quite dismissive of it, but they have all sorts of adventures. And of course, the one thing they don't come back with is, is any sensible deal on the Infanta's hand. They managed to sort of wreck the plans of this great dynastic union between England and Spain. But it's very interesting that Sir Richard is a witness to that, and, and not only a witness, but he produces this account of the royal trip to Spain. And very amusing it is. The Spanish Infanta didn't really take to Charles, the future king. He wasn't a Catholic. He was an infidel who turned his back on the Church of Rome. This wasn't going to be as straightforward as his father James's marriage to the Lutheran princess, Anne of Denmark. When the disguised royal procession finally arrived in Madrid, their host presented them with impossible demands. The Duke of Buckingham got into terrible quarrels with the Spanish equivalent, and so Prince Charles had to negotiate for himself, hardly fitting for a future king. The whole business of adopting disguises as travelling gentlemen and calling yourself Mr. Smith and all this sort of thing, is, it's entirely silly, it's very adolescent. And, you know, going boating and dressing up and getting drunk and, I mean, it, you can imagine how that went down with, with a strict protocol of the court of Madrid. I mean, ridiculous, really, to think that, that anything other than disaster would come out of that. It soon became clear that the Spanish had been stringing Charles all along, just enough to keep England out of the Thirty Years' War. Charles was virtually cast out after bursting in on the young Infanta in her own private garden. The men returned home humiliated. The heat between those hills was such we thought ourselves in stoves. Yet at their heights we walked on snow, and colder it was than England in the midst of... Lank as shotten herring. They feed you not over there. At issue was not the quantity of fare, but its nature. Castile and Aragon together are not worth the meanest county in Wales. With Father's blessing I shall see it published. Did he speak of my return at all? He is as much relieved of your safe arrival as the nation is of the princes, though perhaps with rather less dancing through the streets. I cannot imagine Father ever danced a jig in his life. No, not well, certainly. But come, tell me of it all. Tell me of Spain and the prince's great adventure. You despair of the English court, brother. It is as nothing to the severity of the Spanish. The prince had convinced himself he was in love but all chance of speaking with the Infanta was denied him. The public, however, were delighted by their failure. Eager to court this and embittered by their time in Spain, Charles and Buckingham switched sides. They pushed the reluctant James towards war with Spain. Parliament was summoned once again. This time, its anti-Spanish fervor was equaled by many at court. Despite this combined pressure, James still refused to go to war. But his ability to control events was diminishing. James was dying. Courtiers looked to the future, to Prince Charles, who would soon be king. By his side, in his endeavours, was Sir Richard. 
he would be promoted to first gentleman of the bedchamber. The Wynns had lost their firstborn son and heir at the same time as the Stuarts, the royal family. They were about to lose their patriarch at the same time as well. Sir John Wynne was also succumbing to the ravages of old age. 27th of March, 1625. Dear Father, the King died this day at noon. He had been sick a fortnight with tertian fever. The stag that was dead yet lives. The young king was proclaimed this evening. He has promised he shall deal with me nobly, and I do believe a great office will be mine. I hope this letter finds you well and recovered of your recent sickness. Know that I endeavor each day to be worthy of your example, your dear and loyal son, Richard. In 1625, James dies. He's been ailing for quite a long time. He's been chronically unwell. Because of the way in which he sort of wastes away, and because of the way in which Buckingham is so hated by the political elite, of course, rumour spread very quickly that James had been poisoned. And in fact, Buckingham had, in defiance of the royal doctors, um, arranged for poultices to be applied to him, which it was easy for those that wanted to believe there was foul play, to believe there was foul play, and to a, a degree that historians have only recently begun to reevaluate the story that Buckingham had murdered James and that Charles had condoned it. Those haunted Charles right down to his own death 24 years later, and certainly were very prevalent in the months before the outbreak of civil war. Historians debate James's legacy. To some, he's an intelligent, a flawed man who brought peace in the time of extremism. To others, he was stubborn, extravagant, and his belief in the divine right of kings sowed the seeds for his son's own clashes with Parliament and the bitter English civil war that was to come. In the next episode, we see how Charles I followed in his father's footsteps with his profound belief in the divine right of kings and a misplaced trust in the Duke of Buckingham. Charles' shunning of Parliament and autocratic style of rule fueled enormous political and religious tensions in his kingdoms. A civil war would break out across the British Isles, and in the end, the House of Stuart would fall, and a Commonwealth, headed by a commoner called Oliver Cromwell, would rise in its place. The fall of the monarchy would be a nightmare for the Wynne family of North Wales. They would have to fight to survive in this new puritanical era. England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland would never be the same again. <laughs> <laughs>